everyone. Welcome to our third lecture in Epidemiology and Biostatistics. Today, we are going to learn about Descriptive and Analytic Epidemiology. But before we go into that, we shall look first into the historical evolution of epidemiology. Now, let me remind you once again that when we speak of epidemiology, it does not refer to the study of diseases but uh, CDC defined it, it is the study of the distribution, determinants, health status of a population rather than an individual. Okay, so let's get into the history of epidemiology. So your epidemiology dates back as early as 400 BC during the time of Hippocrates. And you know very well, Hippocrates is the father of medicine. And he is considered to be the first epidemiologist. Now, what is the significant contribution of Hippocrates in the field of epidemiology? He was the first to explain disease occurrence from a rational viewpoint rather than supernatural viewpoint. So he made use of logic. In his essay titled On Airs, Waters, and Places, he suggested that environmental factors and host factors such as behavior might influence the development of disease. Okay? He further explained that sickness could be caused by uh, or if there is an imbalance in a human in the human body of the four humors and when we speak of the four humors he is referring to air fire water and earth of these four elements so according to him if one is missing or there is uh, excess in one then that could lead to sickness and so he suggested or he believed that the cure to the sickness is the elimination or removal or addition of the element or the humor in question okay now this led to our current day practice of bloodletting and dieting okay so now you know that dieting came from from hippocrates and even bloodletting now aside from that he was the first to draw the distinction between endemic diseases and epidemic. Okay, so epidemic, that which is visited upon by in a population, and uh, when we speak of uh, endemic, disease that reside within a population. The next person in our list of significant contributors to the historical development of epidemiology is John Grant, a London businessman who published a book titled Natural and Political Observations Made Upon the Bills of Mortality in 1662. This book contains analysis of 50 years of data extracted from the bills of mortality. This publication was the first to quantify patterns of birth, death, disease occurrence, and noting disparities between males and females. So, death among males exceeded those of females. Another significant observation from this analysis, high infant mortality. So, he observed from uh, the data that one-third of children died at age 5. Aside from that, urban-rural differences and seasonal variations. The third person in our list of personalities that made significant or who made significant contribution in the historical development of epidemiology is William Farr. He was the first to follow the initiative of John Grant. His work together with few other pioneering scientists made or laid the foundation of our 20th century epidemiology. 
He is considered to be the father of modern vital statistics and surveillance because he was able to create a vital statistics system. Okay, he developed, in fact, many of the basic practices used today in vital statistics and disease classification. Another interesting observation made by far is that the risk of cholera is inversely proportional to altitude. In the 1850s, an anesthesiologist in the person of John Snow conducted several investigations on cholera. He even conducted his investigations prior to the development or should I say um, invention of the microscope. So he spent almost his medical career studying about cholera. He conducted a study of cholera outbreaks for two reasons. To discover the cause of the disease and uh, discover or find out ways by which the disease could be prevented from reoccurring. He conducted one of his now famous studies in 1854 when an epidemic of cholera erupted in the Golden Square of London. Because of his rigorous studies on cholera, he is considered to be the father of epidemiology. Please do not forget that John Snow is the father of epidemiology. Now, because he was able to show the transition from descriptive epidemiology to analytic epidemiology, we will look into two of his famous um, studies on cholera. How did he go about this investigation? First, he determined where in this area persons with cholera lived and worked. And then secondly, he marked each residence on a map of the area and I'll be showing the map in a while and this type of map that you will be seeing is what we call now a spot map because it shows the geographic distribution of cases so where are the people with cholera found or situated that is what we call a spot map so here is how a spot map looks like so as you can see on your screen dot dot dots those are the places where people infected with cholera are situated or located. Because Snow believed that water was the source of cholera infection, he marked on his spot map the location of the water pumps and then looked for the relationship between the distribution of household with cholera cases and the location of the pumps. Then he found out that most of the household cases or uh, those with cholera cases rather clustered around pump A rather than pump B or pump C. And then when he interviewed people about it, they said they tried to avoid pump B because it was greatly contaminated and that pump C is inconveniently located too. So from this, he concluded that Pump A was the source of water and was likely the source of infection for people with cholera in the Golden Square area. He however noted that in an area two blocks away from the water source or water pump, there were no reported cases of cholera. And when he did a further investigation, he found out that in that area, there is a brewery and within the premises of the brewery, there is a deep well. And from there, the brewery employees get their water. Also, he found out that brewery employees receive daily portions of malt liquor. So access to the uncontaminated water would explain why none of the brewery employees contracted cholera. So combining all of his observations then, he came up with a firm conclusion that the source of contamination or source of infection was really the water from pump A. So he then reported his findings to municipal officials 
and then the municipal officials responded by removing the handle of the pump and that ended the outbreak. Snow conducted a second investigation by re-examining the data that he collected in 1854 from the cholera outbreak in Great Square, London. Because he noted that districts with the highest death rates were serviced by two water companies. They are South Wark and Vauxhall only, Lambeth, and Vauxhall and Lambeth. As you can see in Table 1.1, the death rate of districts served only by South Wark and Vauxhall only is more than five times higher than in those served only by Lambeth Company. So, interestingly, the mortality rate in districts supplied by both companies fell between the rates for districts served exclusively by either company. Okay, at that time, both companies obtained their water from the Thames River at intake points that were downstream from London. And so, it's susceptible to contamination from London sewage which were discharged directly into the Thames. So to avoid contamination by London sewage, in 1852, the Lambeth Company moved its intake waterworks to a site on the Thames, well upstream from London. And then the data or the table shows a seven-week period of summer of 1954, or 1854 rather, when he compared mortality among districts that received water from one or other or both water companies. So these data were consistent with the hypothesis that water obtained from the Thames below London was the source of cholera. And alternatively, the population supplied by the two companies may have differed on other factors that affected the risk of cholera. He then conducted further investigation to test his water supply hypothesis. So he focused on the districts served by both companies because the households within a district were generally comparable except for water supply company. And then he identified the water supply company for every house in which a death from cholera had occurred during the seven-week period. So these investigations by John Snow also made significant contributions to our current-day epidemiology. It established the sequence of steps that epidemiologists should undertake when investigating diseases. So he was able to come up with a testable hypothesis by first characterizing the case and the population at risk by time, by place, and by person. And then he tested his hypothesis and came up with the conclusion that water could be a source of contamination. It could be a vehicle for transmitting cholera and that epidemiologic information could be used to direct, prompt, and appropriate public health action. So now we move on to the 19th and the 20th century. In the mid and late 1800s, epidemiologists have started to make use of the epidemiological method established by John Snow in the investigation of disease occurrence. Now during this time period, most investigations focus on acute infectious diseases. In the 1930s and 1940s, epidemiologists extended their investigation to include non-infectious diseases. So the period since World War II has seen an explosion in the development of research methods and the theoretical underpinnings of epidemiology. And epidemiology has been applied to the entire range of health-related outcomes behaviors, and even knowledge and attitudes. During the 1960s and early 1970s, health workers applied epidemiologic 
methods to eradicate naturally occurring smallpox worldwide. And in the 1980s, epidemiology was again extended to include studies of injuries and violence. So you can see the transition. It started from study of infectious diseases to non-infectious diseases to now injuries and violence or diseases brought about by injuries and violence. In 1990s, the related fields of molecular and genetic epidemiology took root. Okay? New infections or new agents like Ebola virus, HIV, AIDS were identified. Now, beginning in the 1990s and accelerating after the terrorist attack of September 11, 2001, epidemiologists have to consider spread of diseases, infectious diseases from biologic warfare and bioterrorism. And today, public health workers throughout the world accept and use epidemiology regularly to characterize the health of their communities and to solve day-to-day -day problems large and small. Okay, we now proceed with the application part. Now, if you could remember from our previous discussion, from our previous lecture, that there are five W's okay, of epidemiology. The what, or the case definition. The who, the person. Where, place. When, time. Why, or how, the causes. And the risk factors, modes of transmission. So, when we speak of descriptive epidemiology, it covers the three W's, the who, person, the where, place, and the when, time. Now, why do we have to compile and analyze data by time, by place, and by person? The following are the reasons. Number one, first, by looking at the data, if data is compiled, analyzed, summarize the epidemiologist can see what the data can or cannot reveal based on the available variables and even its limitations second if data is compiled and analyzed by time by person and by place epidemiologist learns the extent and the pattern of the public health problem being investigated which month, which neighborhood, which groups of people have the most and the least cases. Third, the epidemiologist creates a detailed description of the health of a population that can be easily communicated with tables, graphs, and maps. Fourth, the epidemiologist can identify areas or groups within a population that have high rates of disease, which in turn provides information or important clues to the causes of the disease. And these clues could also be turned into testable hypotheses. Okay, now let's look into the three, okay, three factors or three scopes of your descriptive epidemiology, particularly time. Okay, we begin with time. There are diseases that changes over time. Okay, sometimes they are predictable, the others are unpredictable. But in contrast, diseases such as HEPA B cannot occur at any time. So some are predictable, others are unpredictable. Now for diseases that occur seasonally, health officials can anticipate their occurrence and implement control and prevention measures such as influenza vaccine or campaign for mosquito spraying, avoid dengue, fumigation like what our government is doing. For diseases that occur sporadically, investigators can conduct studies to identify the causes 
and modes of spread and then develop appropriately targeted actions to control or prevent further occurrence of the disease. How important is displaying the patterns of disease occurrence by time? This is very important, very vital for monitoring disease occurrence in the community and for assessing whether the public health interventions made a difference. Now, time data are usually displayed with a two-dimensional graph, usually a line graph or a bar graph or particularly a histogram, where in the y-axis, y-axis, uh, shows the number of cases or rate of cases and your x-axis the horizontal axis is the time period such as years months days minutes hours seconds okay the number of rate or the number of, or rate of cases is plotted over time now let me show you examples of line graphs and histogram So, figure 1.4 reported cases of salmonellosis per 1,000 population by year 1972 to 2007 in the United States. So, along your x-axis okay, or the horizontal axis are the years and along the y-axis are the number of reported cases of salmonellosis per 1,000, 100,000 population. This is an example of a line graph. The second is a histogram. So figure 1.5 shows the number of intususceptions reports after the Resus rotavirus vaccine tetravalent or RRVTV by vaccination day in the United States from September 1998 to December 1999. So like what uh, the previous graph show, the x-axis are the time periods in months and your y-axis are the number of reported <laughs> cases. Sometimes a graph shows the timing of the events that are related to disease trends being displayed. So, for instance, the graph may indicate the period of exposure or date control measures were implemented. Now, studying a graph that notes the period of exposure may lead to insights into what may have caused the illness. And studying the graph that notes the timing of control measures shows what impact, if any, the measures may have had on the disease occurrence. Okay, so as noted in the previous two, two graphs, the time period is plotted along the x-axis and the number of occurrence or number of cases or rates of cases are plotted along the y-axis. Now, the time period depends upon the particular disease being investigated. There are instances when the time period could be as broad as years or decades or as brief as days, minutes, or even uh, hours, hours, minutes. Okay, for many chronic diseases, um, for those that require long-term trends or patterns in the number of cases, okay, it could take years okay but for other conditions such as um, foodborne outbreaks okay the relevant time scale is likely to be days or hours next we have secular long-term trends so graphing the annual cases or rates of cases of a specific disease over a period of years that's long term okay and health officials use these graphs to assess the prevailing direction of a disease, whether it's increasing, decreasing, or essentially flattening. And this will help them evaluate 
programs and make policy decisions and make inferences about what caused the increase or decrease in the occurrence of the disease. And if the graph indicates when related events took place, use past trends as predictor of future incidence of the disease. The time period could also be in terms of day of the week and time of the day. There are some conditions okay, that require displaying data by day of the time, by day of the week, or time of the day, because that would be very informative. Okay, analysis of these shorter time periods is particularly appropriate for conditions related to occupational or environmental exposures that tend to occur regularly at regularly scheduled intervals. In your screen, you can see figure 1.7, okay, showing farm tractor fatalities by days of the week, okay. Note that the number of farm tractor fatalities on Sundays, okay, Sundays was about half the number on the other days. So looking at the heights, the heights of the bars, okay, by the way, this is a histogram, so it's given in the form of a histogram, the heights correspond to the number of fatalities or number of deaths. Okay, so the height of the, the vertical bar for Sunday is in fact twice as long as the other days as compared to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Next, this time, okay, figure 1.8. It's the pattern of farm tractor injuries by hour. So a while ago it was day of the week, this time by hour. In figure 1.8, as you can see, the number of injuries peak at 11 a.m., and then there's a dip at the, at the noon, and then again peak at 4 p.m. These patterns may suggest hypotheses and possible explanations that could be evaluated with further study. Next is epidemic period. Now to show the time course of a disease outbreak or an epidemic, epidemiologists use a graph called the epidemic curve. So as with the other graphs, the epidemic curve's y-axis shows the number of cases, while the x-axis this time shows either the date, okay, date of symptom onset, onset or date of diagnosis. So date when the symptom appeared and or the date of diagnosis. So depending on the incubation period, so when you speak of incubation period, what do we mean by that? It's the length of time between exposure and onset of symptom. Incubation period for COVID, the incubation period is 14 days. This is why anyone who has traveled outside, outside the municipality, outside the city, should stay at home 14 days. Within 14 days, the symptoms may appear if you are infected. The time period rather could be as narrow as minutes, okay? For, for example, for food poisoning, okay? By chemicals that cause symptoms within minutes or a number of days, like your COVID, okay? 14 days incubation period. But conventionally, the data are displayed in a histogram, okay? Histogram, a bar chart. The only difference between a histogram and a bar graph is that for a histogram, there are no gaps in between the bars. Here is an example of an epidemic curve, figure 1.10, okay? Figure 1.10. Time, date, and time of symptom of onset. Date and time of symptom onset along the x-axis and along the y-axis are the number of cases. So the shape and other features of an epidemic curve can suggest hypothesis about the time 
and source of exposure, mode of transmission, and causative agent. So when we speak of time period, it could be decades or years, or months, okay, or hours, day of the week, hours of the day, or incubation period, okay, onset of symptom or exposure, but depending upon the type of disease under investigation. Okay, another scope of your descriptive epidemiology is place. When we describe the occurrence of disease by place, it provides insight into the geographic extent of the problem and its geographic variation. Characterization by place refers not only to the place of residence but to any geographic location relevant to disease occurrence such as a uh, place of diagnosis or report, birthplace, uh, employment site, school district, your recent travel destination. So these are all under place. The unit may be as large as a continent or a country or as small as a street address, a zone, a barangay, a hospital wing, an operating room. So sometimes place refers not to a specific location but uh, to a place category such as also rural or urban, domestic or foreign, institutional, institutional or no institutional. Now the next tables that I'm going to show you are the SARS data first by the first table would show you the source of data and the second table would show you the travel history okay the travel history of the patients who are SARS infected table 1.3 in particular displays SARS data by source of report and reflects where a person with possible SARS is likely to be quarantined and treated whereas in table 1.4 as you can see, it displays the same data, okay? But this time, it shows where the possible SARS patients may have had traveled and where the transmission may have occurred. So in the first uh, table, it shows the source of the report. And then in the second table, history of travel and where the transmission could have possibly Occurred. When we speak of place, we may not necessarily refer to the place of residence but to any geographic location pertinent to the disease. The next focus is on the person. Okay. Since personal characteristics may affect, okay, may affect illness or the susceptibility of a person to contract a disease, then inherent characteristics of a person must be considered in organizing and analyzing data. What we mean by this when we speak about person, we mean the attributes of a person including age, sex, ethnicity, race, socioeconomic status, and, and so on. Now, the single most important person attribute, okay, that uh, epidemiologists should consider is age because you know for a fact that almost every health related event varies with age okay for example your covid according to voh uh, which age group are more susceptible or most susceptible to contracting the disease those who are senior citizens or those who belong to the bracket 60 and above, okay? Age. So a number of factors that also vary with age include, like what I mentioned a while ago, susceptibility, opportunity for exposure, latency or incubation period, and physiologic response, which affects, among other things, disease development. So when analyzing data by age, 
epidemiologists try to use age groups that are narrow enough to detect any age-related patterns that may be present in the data. So for some diseases, particularly chronic diseases, a 10-year age groups may be okay, adequate. For other diseases, 10-year and even 5-year age groups conceal very important variations in disease occurrence by age. Next, personal attribute, personal attribute that should be considered by epidemiologists is sex. Now, it was found out or it's already an accepted fact that males have higher rates of illness, illness and death, even death, than do females for many diseases. For some diseases, this sex-related difference is because of genetic, hormonal, anatomic, or other inherent difference between the sexes. So these inherent differences affect susceptibility or physiologic responses. So, for example, the premenopausal women have a lower risk of heart disease than men of the same age. So, these differences, or difference rather, can be attributed to the higher estrogen levels in women. Now, on the other hand, the sex-related difference in the occurrence of many diseases reflect differences in opportunity or levels of exposure. Okay? For example, figure 1.14 for the line graph shown, it shows the differences in the lung cancer rates over time among women and men. So the difference noted in earlier years has been attributed to higher prevalence of smoking among men in the past. Okay? Now, unfortunately, the prevalence of smoking among women now equals that of men. So, the lung cancer rates in women have also been increasing because of that. Another personal attribute that must be considered by epidemiologists when studying diseases is ethnic and racial groups. Sometimes, Okay, epidemiologists are interested in analyzing person by biologic, cultural, or social grouping such as race, nationality, religion, or social groups such as tribes and other geographical or socially isolated groups. Differences in racial, ethnic, or other group variables may reflect differences in susceptibility or exposure or differences in other factors that influence the risk of disease. The next personal attribute that must be considered by epidemiologists in study when studying diseases is socioeconomic status, but this is a variable which is very difficult to quantify because it is an interplay of many other variables such as occupation, family income, educational achievements, census tract, living conditions, and social standing. These variables are easy to measure but may not accurately reflect the overall concept of socioeconomic status. But nevertheless, Epidemiologists commonly use occupation, family income, educational attainment, while recognizing that these variables do not measure socioeconomic status precisely. Okay? Now, the frequency of many adverse health conditions increases with socioeconomic status. For instance, TB or tuberculosis is more common among persons or families along the lower strata, okay? The low socioeconomic status. Infant mortality also and time loss from work due to disability are both associated with lower income.
come. So these patterns may reflect more harmful exposures, lower resistance, less access to health care. Or they may in part reflect an interdependent relationship that is impossible to untangle. We now proceed to the common uses of epidemiologic information. So epidemiologic information may have been used in several ways, but some of the common uses are the following. Number one, for assessing the community's health. Number two, for making individual decisions. Number three, completing the clinical picture. And number four, searching for causes. Now let's look into the four of them one by one beginning with assessing the community's health. Okay, now public health officials responsible for policy development, implementation, and policy evaluation use information from epidemiologists as a factual framework for making decisions. Okay, to assess the health of a population or community, relevant sources of data must be identified and analyzed by again person place and time okay also it's used for purpose of diagnosis and prognosis now the questions the following questions must be addressed number one what are the factual or should i say actual and potential health problems in the community what or where are they occurring? Which populations are at increased risk? Which problems have declined over time? Which ones are increasing or have potential to increase? How do these patterns relate to the level and distribution of public health services available? So more detailed data may need to be collected and analyze to determine whether health services are available, accessible, effective, and efficient. Okay. For instance, public health officials use epidemiologic data and methods to identify baseline data to set health goals and later monitor progress by comparing current data to the baseline data that they have gathered okay another common use of information from epidemiologists making individual decisions so many of us today may not realize that we are using information epidemiologic information in our daily decisions okay most particularly uh, particularly that which uh, concerns our health. So many of you may have um, decided to quit smoking, okay? Or some of you may have decided not to eat too much sweets, or instead of taking the tricycle, you would rather uh, walk to school or to the nearest grocery or to um, the supermarket instead of taking tricycle you may not know it or whether consciously unconsciously you were influenced by epidemiologic information when you decided to quit okay eating your sweets or um, quit smoking or taking healthy meals instead of chichiria instead of junk food in 1950s, epidemiologists reported that the increase of lung cancer among, that there is an increase in lung cancer among smokers. So, because of, of knowing this information, okay, you may have uh, decided to quit smoking. Another one, in the 1970s, epidemiologists documented the role of exercise and uh, proper diet in reducing the risk of heart disease. This may have been your basis of uh, quitting 
or deciding to take a walk okay, and going to the supermarket rather than uh, taking the tricycle because if it's a few meters away anyway then you can uh, walk and that is a form of exercise. This and hundreds of other epidemiologic findings are directly relevant to the choices that we make every day. Okay? Choices that affect our health over a lifetime. So that's under making individual decisions. The third use of epidemiologic uh, information is for completing the clinical practice. So when investigating a disease outbreak, epidemiologists rely on healthcare providers and laboratory technicians to establish proper diagnosis of individual patients. But epidemiologists also contribute to the physician's undertakings of the critical picture okay, and natural history of disease. For instance, in 1989, a physician saw three patients with unexplained um, eosinophilia or an increase in the number of specific type of WBC. Okay? But uh, although the physician could not make a definitive diagnosis, he notified uh, public health authorities. Within weeks, epidemiologists had identified enough other cases to characterize the spectrum and course of the illness that came to be known now as the Iosinophilia myalgia syndrome. And more recently, epidemiologists, clinicians, and researchers around the world have collaborated to characterize SARS and right now COVID okay so this is caused by a uh, type of coronavirus which emerged in China so how do epidemiologists complete the clinical picture now physicians may provide the prognosis but epidemiologists complete the picture by providing additional data or additional information regarding the pattern occurrence of the disease. Epidemiology and laboratory science converge to provide evidence needed to establish causation. For example, in the case of COVID-19, okay, COVID um, the doctors as well as epidemiologists around the world were able to uh, identify variety of risk factors.